Hello, welcome back to The Daily Highlights. Great to have you joining us. My name is Astrid Froloff. I'm going to guide you through this session. If you want to get inspired and get some nice recommendations about the program of Falling Walls and uh, the Berlin Science Week, you are at the right place. Um, and I would like to introduce uh, one event which is coming up, which is highly interesting. In times where we are confronted with a global pandemic, mistrust and misinformation, it seems that science engagement plays a more and more important role. And in our winner session today, we are celebrating researchers who will present their breakthroughs in their respective category uh, in the field of science engagement. And I'm glad to be virtually connected now to the jury chair of the winner session in the category Science Engagement and talk to her. Hello, Melanie Smallman, co-director of the new Center for Science Communication at UCL. Hello, nice having you with us. Hi. Hi. Melanie, Hi, how, do you, you. how do you regard the role of science engagement today? Yeah, I think that involving people in thinking about and doing science has always been really, really important. But I think this year we've seen, you know, in the face of a global pandemic, that getting it right for some people can be a matter of life or death. So I think, you know, whether you're, you're involving citizens in helping them understand how vaccines work or just encouraging more young people to go into science, I think it's really vital work right now. Yeah, we are looking forward very much to see the breakthroughs of the year in, in this uh, category today. And it seems there is a lot of creativity in it, a lot of enthusiasm. Can you give us a sneak peek into the category? Yeah, we saw an amazing array of projects that are involving citizens in science and discussions about science from across the world. Every corner of the world was represented. We even had projects that were going into prisons to involve oh. people in thinking about science. And we saw projects that were uh, helping women and girls into science. We saw projects that were bringing communities together through astronomy. We even saw projects that were trapping people in science themed escape rooms so that they could learn more about science. Wow. And the things they had in common was that they were original, like you say, that their, their owners were enthusiastic. Um, but most importantly, they were really sort of breaking down that wall between science and society. You obviously have a great overview over the subjects and over the projects we will see. Um, what are your practical recommendations to scientists who want to engage the public? Well, I think there's two really important things um, for scientists wanting to engage with the public to do. So first of all, think really hard about your audience. Think about who it is you want to engage, why they may be interested in science, um, but also think about what you could learn from them so that it's listening as well as speaking. And mm. I think secondly, there's loads of projects engaging citizens with science. So look around and see if somebody is already doing or has tried what you're interested in, um, because you might learn something from them. They may have lessons for you. Um, and a really good place to start are the engaged projects that we're showcasing today. Mm -hmm. uh, Melanie, can you tell us how does the pandemic change the way scientists are communicating their issues? Yeah, well, I think it's become suddenly all the more important that people hear from the scientists about um, the science and have, you know, a better understanding of how diseases and vaccines work. And I think one of the things that we have seen is scientists becoming much more visible. So a lot more pressure on them to communicate and a lot more need to learn from the past about how to do it better. So we've had a case, a situation um, in the past few weeks where the scientists used lots of graphs in a press conference and loads of people you know, found these really difficult to understand. So communicating effectively um, is really, really important. But the encouraging thing is that all of the surveys around the world have shown that public confidence and public trust in scientists has really gone up during the pandemic as scientists have come out and communicated. The public have responded very positively to it. 
Okay, thank you for the moment. Melanie, you stay with us since you will join the winner sessions. You will be the jury chair for the category uh, science engagement. So thank you for the moment. Now let's talk about something different, about future technologies. Also in this field, uh, the um, science engagement plays a very important role. Um, I'm eager to talk about this with Martin Kugler. He is with the Austrian Institute of Technology. Hello, great to have you with us, Martin. Uh, your institute Hello. is applying science to build the green infrastructure of the future. What is your vision about it? Yes, the AIT, Austrian Institute of Technology, is Austria's largest research and technology organization. We have around 1,400 researchers and experts who support business and society, particularly in the areas of digitization, decarbonization, and other challenges of climate change. Uh, to answer your question, on the one hand, we have a strong expertise in fields like energy, mobility systems, low emission transport, health and bioresources, digital safety and security, automation, and so on. On the other hand, uh, this specific expertise is not enough because we have to have a view on the whole systems. This is very important because it's not possible to solve our complex problems with a single solution. So to cope, for example, with climate change, it is necessary to combine expertise from different disciplines we have to use synergies between them, and we have to avoid unintended consequences of our actions. That's our main point, how we deal with these problems. Okay, well, the expert talks you are hosting uh, during the summit today gives an image on how technology can shape a green future. Can you give us a little uh, pre-taste, a little schmankerl, as you say in Austria, uh, into yeah. some of the most interesting uh, insights? Yes, of course. In our expert talk, we get some insight in the fields, natural resources, urban planning, battery research, cooperative digital technologies and mobility systems. And for me, the most interesting issue is the future design of cities and regions. At the AIT, we installed recently a so-called city intelligence lab where we combine new digital methods for designing smart cities. In this lab, it is possible to modify any design and compute immediately the um, effects this has, for example, on mobility of the people, on energy demand, or on heat episodes in the summer and so on. This is possible by removing all barriers between different fields of expertise such as architecture, energy, mobility, and so. Instead of this former sectoral view, we use cutting edge technologies such as artificial intelligence or augmented reality to integrate all aspects in one platform. Mm -hmm. And this allows an integrated urban planning together with planners, with city administration, with the people who are living in the city, with stakeholders and politicians. And this, forms the basis for innovation and solutions for future cities and regions which are more sustainable, more resilient, and more livable. Okay, looking forward to learn more in your event. Thank you very much, Martin Kugler, for giving us an insight. Well, what else is on our agenda today? Let me highlight some of our events. One event I would like to highlight is uh, in German language. It's called Menschliche und Maschinelle Intelligenz Verstehen. And this is uh, an event where you can play the game Mastermind. And by doing this, you learn about human and machine intelligence. There is another lesson coming up, lessons learned from the first DARPA type challenge launched in Europe, an event hosted by the Joint European Disruptive Initiative. This will be today at 3 p.m. German time. The family STEM quiz. Uh, this is something interesting. Join our chief imagination officer from South Africa, Steve Sherman, for a fun family quiz and compete against families from all over the world. So this is something really new and an interesting way to communicate. Let's have a look at some more events coming up in the next 24 hours. Uh, there is a 
one thing uh, saying learn about career prospects for international junior researchers in Germany. This event brings together junior researchers and alumni from Technische University Berlin who have successfully established their career on the German uh, job market. And the last uh, event I would like to recommend is um, Institutionalizing Science Engagement. This is a workshop organized by the Falling Walls Engage team, tackling the question how we can improve information sharing and allow everyone to learn about and be involved in science. So, and now it's getting a bit slimy. We will talk about squids, snails, clams, the kingdom of the mollusk group, which is rich and is oddly fascinating. That's why the Museum für Naturkunde Berlin has decided a scientific variety show to the mollusks. The idea comes from the Berlin artist Ines Thalais and her ensemble. And the show wants to drive forward the dialogue between culture, science and society. So premieres in German are on November 8th and in English on November 11th. Get more about this. Times like these show how important it is for science to be visible. The Museum of Natural History in Berlin has found a vivid and special approach to science communication, a scientific variety show. David Ziegler, the show's project lead, explains the concept. Our contribution to the Berlin Science Week is the variety show Glitzern and Denken. It's a science variety show, so we bring artists and scientists on stage together to perform a show which has elements of circus, which has elements of theater and is themed by a scientific topic. This year our topic is slimy because our show deals with the animal group of mollusks which consist of snails, octopuses and clams. The new show wants to inspire people to be curious and create a fascination for nature. We want to make an impact on the future by finding a new way of speaking about science. And this new way should less be guided by the principles of scientific report, but more by the principles of storytelling and by the principles of art, the way we speak with our friends and family. I think we have a great chance of improving our communication about science if we show our emotions, if we show our passions, because this will give us a different channel to the broad public and to the people, talking about which impact science makes for our everyday lives and how it helps us to make the world better. A great challenge in our project is finding a common ground for the artists and the scientists to work together. Because in a way they're very similar, because they both deal with human creativity. But in a way, they're also very different because the way they express this creativity and the methods they use, their every, everyday life, are very different. A challenge of our project is finding a productive use of the frictions and the interference that this creates. One of the main events uh, during the Falling Walls is a series of circle tables. Uh, World-leading scientists and policymakers from academia are discussing the post-corona agenda and uh, today's Circle Table will present three international experts who have contributed to significant breakthroughs in water diagnosis methods. So this will come up today at four o'clock German time. As every day, we will close our daily highlights with a short story from German photographer Herlinde Kölbe. For her book, Fascination Science, she visited a lot of highly interesting scientists all around the globe and brought back amazing pictures and fantastic background stories. Felix Rundel talked to her about the stories. Helinda, today's portrait is of Françoise barré sinoussi a French virologist who received a Nobel Prize for her work on HIV. What is the story behind the portrait? You know, uh, when she was a young scientist, male scientists told her it should be better to stay at home and take care of her children. But 
she said she refused these kind of things. And also she was very dedicated to her research. And a wonderful story, you know, uh, when the wedding day came, she went to the lab uh, to do a little bit research. And then suddenly her husband called, you know, we are here waiting with all the people. Where are you now? Today is our wedding. I said, oh, I forgot it because I, I thought the time is running and I didn't see it. And so immediately she, she went to her own wedding. And, you know, in 1983, she discovered that the HIV virus was the reason for the disease, but still it took a long time to find a treatment for it. And uh, she got the Nobel Prize for her research, but still she is very modest that, you know, I'm a puzzle because many scientists contributed also to the research. Now she is retired and the lab is closed. And that's the reason in France always when you're retired. And she's still working as an NGO in several countries. And now we will continue immediately with our winner sessions and experience, fantastic science breakthroughs in the fields of engineering and technology and science engagement. So please stay with us. See you in a minute. Hello, welcome. It's time again for our daily winner session. We are presenting the Falling Wall Science Breakthroughs of the Year 2020. And my name is Astrid Frohloff. I'm a TV journalist and I have the pleasure to guide you through this session. Over the past month, nearly a thousand nominees have made the journey to become the Science Breakthrough of the Year in their respective category. And today we will meet the top 10 winners in the following category. So this is our first category, engineering and technology. I'm happy to introduce to you Adam Levy, who is on my side in the studio. He's a science journalist and a physician and physicist, and uh, <laughs> I have the pleasure to be with you and to learn more from you about the winners since you did interviews with all winners. And I am also very glad to welcome now online Joel Messo, the jury chair of this category and the president of ETH Zürich. It's great to have you joining us today. Thank you very much. Joel Messo is representing the distinguished jury today. Every category is overlooked by very prominent jury members. Uh, here you see the jury of engineering and technology, and we are very grateful indeed for their fantastic contributions. Well, Joel, uh, being the chair of this jury, um, we know we are facing huge problems, the climate change, the pandemic, the drifting apart of societies. In which amount technology can help to tackle our problems? What do you think? Well, if you look at what happened uh, in the past 20 years, then uh, our welfare and high standards of living are greatly owed to technological advances. And this trend is clearly now even accelerating, but there is a big but. I think it would be naive to think technology needs to be. Can you hear me? Um, we, I think indeed we had some little technical problems, but now you are back, obviously. Okay. 
Now we can hear you. Okay. Please I go ahead. I was I was saying that in order to be successful, technology needs alone is not sufficient. It needs to be socially acceptable. It needs to be economically viable. So technology, yes, is part of the solution to the global challenges, but not sufficient. Um, Joel, if you had to bet on just one technology to help us move forward in a real big way, what would it be in your eyes? Oh, I'm afraid we lost Joel. No, here he is again. I'm not sure if you can hear me, Joel. Yes, I can. I can. <laughs> okay, I think we're back. We hear you and yes, see you. There are interruptions, unfortunately. Yes. Yeah. Let's see if we can manage. Can you can you tell me what would be the major technology you would bet on if you had money? Well, that's very difficult question, right? There are so much potentially disruptive technologies in AI, gene editing, robotics, quantum technology. I would see first on the medium term, I think hydrogen will play an important role for the energy transition. And on the longer term, I take quantum. Uh, that is, uh, there is a revolution currently unfolding and the potential is huge. Uh, this will enable us to take tackle major current prob problems in unprecedented ways. This will lead to disruptions ranging from physics to biology, agriculture, cryptography, mobility, and consumer products. So I think once quantum physics has reached a broad application range, then the world will be, might be different one. Okay, thank you for the moment, Joel. I come back to you, but let me first uh, ask uh, Adam. Uh, you've got the chance to interview all the winners uh, in this category. What can we expect? Well, I'm beginning to sound like a broken record, but this is a very diverse category with such a range of topics covered. I think uh, maybe what distinguishes this category is uh, so many of these topics are laser focused on building that future that we need for, for climate change, for, for social reasons. And so uh, lots of these are at the stage of um, bringing ideas from the lab uh, out to applications or, or certainly have, have that in mind in the next few years. Then let's get an overview uh, to the top 10 list of this category. Our first winner today is a scientist from the German Aerospace Center. I'm glad to announce Stefan Brendelberger. His breakthrough is about solar kerosene. And I'm asking Joel, why did the jury decide for this work, Joel? Well, green energy for aviation is a huge issue in the coming years. And Stefan Brandelberger advocates an innovative solution to produce solar kerosene in a thermochemical process that can substantially reduce the footprint of the av aviation industry. Okay, then let's learn more. Here comes the video. Breaking the wall of solar kerosene. Stefan Brendelberger, German Aerospace Center, DLR. Solar kerosene will help us to reduce the emissions of flying. Instead of developing new aircraft, which are powered by hydrogen or batteries, we take the existing aircrafts and replace the fuel. No more fossil fuel, but renewable fuel with substantially lower emissions. This is the solar kerosene. We developed the production process, which is called solar thermochemical cycling. It makes use of concentrated solar energy to turn CO2 and water into the liquid fuel. And can you give a sense of what this process actually looks like? How are you turning sunlight and carbon dioxide and water into kerosene? First of all, you have to collect the sunlight. We use large mirror fields, which reflect the sunlight onto a top of a tower where a receiver reactor sits. The receiver reactor has an opening, which is of the size of my head. And through this opening, the radiation enters into the reactor. There, a structure heats up and releases oxygen. And then in a second step, the structure gets cooled down and is brought into contact with CO2 and water and splits the water and CO2. This produces synthesis gas, which is later then uh, further processed in a conventional Fischer-Tropsch plant into liquid fuel, the kerosene. 
How big a part of the fight against climate change is combating flying? So, so far, it plays a minor role. But in the future, we will have to cut down emissions in all sectors. And in the other sectors, it will be quite easy or there are at least solutions on the table already how to do it. With flying, it's much more difficult. You have to either come up with new airplane technologies or then you could use the solar kerosene to reduce the emissions. So on the target to become climate neutral, it will be very important to develop such uh, alternatives to conventional fossil fuel. Of course, the environmental qualities of this kerosene are incredibly important, but also important are what it would end up costing and how much you can make. What, what do we know about these questions at the moment? So the potential from the quantity side is very good. Solar energy is widely available. And as long as we go to sites with a lot of um, direct irradiation, the potential to develop the process such that we can um, then replace all fossil fuel with solar kerosene is, is already there. Um, from the cost side, it looks like it, it will be still more expensive than fossil fuel. And, could be in the range of maybe two to three times. And this would maybe increase the price of a ticket. Price for fuel is in the range of 25%. So this could be 50% increase in ticket price. What's your ultimate hope for the impact that this solar kerosene could have on our fight against climate change? So we hope that uh, we can contribute in defossilizing also the aviation sector. And yeah, since this is a very difficult task to achieve, um, we think it's important to start acting now. Well, Adam, sun to liquid, where do you see the potential of this technology? Well, we, we need to get to net zero emissions globally. Um, and flying is to some extent the thorn in, uh, in our side for that. Uh, it's really hard to see how we can fly without fossil fuels or completely changing um, the aircraft we, we use. Um, and so an idea like this, which says, well, why don't we build fossil fuels without, uh, that build these airplane fuels without fossil fuels, that really circumnavigates this mm -hmm. issue. Well, our next winner is addressing two major problems we are facing currently, housing people and the climate change. And I'm glad to announce Karen Scrivener, EPFL Lausanne. And I'd like to ask the jury chair what was most convincing for the jury to go for Karen. So um, cement is the main component in concrete production and it's responsible for 8% of man-made CO2 emission. And Karen Scrivener presents a solution to replace 50% of conventional cement by not CO2 emitting clay-based materials. This is what convinced the jury. That's interesting. Let's have a look at the interview Adam took earlier. Breaking the wall of housing people while minimizing climate change. Karen Scrivener, EPFL Lausanne. Our breakthrough is related to cement and concrete. And this is really the only material that can respond to the demand of people for decent housing and infrastructure. So we hear a lot about this headline figure that it produces 8% CO2. But we have to realize this is only because it makes up more than all other solid materials put together. And in fact, intrinsically, it's a very low CO2 material. And even from a resource point of view, we couldn't replace it with other materials. For example, if we wanted to replace 25% of concrete by wood, we would have to plant new forests one and a half times size of India. So this provides a big opportunity because, of course, if we can make the, the, the cement more efficient, then we have a huge impact. And this is behind our innovation, which we call LC3, limestone calcine clay cement. And in this cement, we replace about half of the conventional cement by a combination of limestone and calcine clay. And what's really exciting about this is the fact that this can be implemented all around the world really quickly. Uh, we have the materials available, we have the technology available, and they can use it virtually like the existing material. Uh, how, how does your concrete compare 
to conventional concrete? Well, this is really one of the strong points that it really behaves in virtually identical way. From our first trial in Cuba, we could take uh, this first material, which was by no means the optimum, take it to a plant producing concrete blocks, give it to the people there, and they could use it in exactly the same way as the original material, but of course with much reduced CO2. So what stage are you at today in actually getting this out of the lab? We made our first industrial trial uh, about eight years ago in Cuba. Then we took the technology to India. The first commercial cement based on this was in fact introduced to the market in Colombia earlier this year. So it, it's very much out there, but I think we're just at the start and this is going to uh, really go up very fast uh, from now on. How do we actually convince manufacturers around the world to take up this new and different approach to, to building cement? The important factors are the superabundance of the raw materials we need, the ready availability and the flexibility of the technology, and not least, it's actually cheaper to produce. That the factor that can make them change their mind is if you tell them they can save costs. And I think that's a really big driving force. Now, if tomorrow we clicked our fingers and suddenly replaced all the concrete uh, manufacturing with, with your modified concrete, how, how would that bring down the emissions? Well, the figures are tremendous. We made a conservative estimate that we could save around 400 million tons of CO2 per year. But if really we worked at it and took it to its full potential, I think we could go to at least double that. So that's removing uh, the equivalent of about 2% of all man-made CO2. Um, of course, it's not everything. There are still other things that need to be done. These are subjects we're researching on here. And of course, working with colleagues all around the world to do even better. Well, this brings me to the question, Adam, how difficult is it to bring innovations like this into practical use? Well, I think uh, this topic really shows that getting an idea out of the lab is such an important first step, but it's not the end of the journey, uh, especially for an idea like this, which you want to take over the entire world. Um, actually convincing everyone around the world to replace what they're doing now uh, with a new, hopefully better approach. That takes a lot of time and effort, and that's, that's a project in itself. Let's take a look at our next winner. I am delighted to announce Metin City, who is working on breaking the wall to wireless medical robots inside our body. So, uh, Joel, what's behind this project and what convinced the jury about it? Well, as you said, Metin City's uh, wireless medical micro robots have many degrees of freedom and represent a high potential for a breakthrough in the non-invasive medicine of the future. Okay, this is exciting. Let's have a look at the interview now. Breaking the wall to wireless medical robots inside our body. Metin City, Max Planck Institute for Intelligent Systems. My research has created breakthrough wireless sought medical robots, which can just stay inside our body and navigate in hard to reach, tight and even unprecedented inner body sites to diagnose and treat diseases. They can navigate in complex and tight body regions by using seven locomotion modes, such as crawling, rolling, jumping and swimming, inspired by salt bodied animals in nature, such as caterpillars, worms and jellyfishes. Such wireless implantable medical robots would revolutionize the healthcare. They will save more lives of patients by curing diseases more efficiently, faster, with much less side effects and at much earlier stages. This soft robot is remotely controlled, but how do you actually control it from outside the body? Around the patient, we can put magnetic coils like an MRI that has uh, controlled fields that will in, uh, create shape deformations on the robot, like a loop or a sine wave, just using remote magnetic fields that we can control by computer very precisely. Mm -hmm. what, what does it mean to you personally to have developed this robot? 
we always dreamed to have small machines inside our body because we are so curious to know what's happening inside our body and also how can we diagnose and treat diseases and many other things going on inside our body. This has been a great dream that now in our research, we are trying to realize and achieve this dream uh, with really small, tiny machines that will become real rather than just a science fiction. Some people might be hearing about this idea to put a robot inside you for medical reasons and be a bit nervous. Uh, how big is the thing we're talking about here? Uh, our soft robots are in the mini scale size, which is on the order of very small, uh, basically rice grain. And we can make it even smaller and smaller down to almost hair diameter. Uh, how much are organic uh, beings inspirations for the robots you design? We looked at soft-bodied animals like worms, caterpillars, jellyfishes, and we got inspiration from their motion and locomotion behavior inside complex media, like inside our body, and so that our robot could replicate similar behavior with, their, uh, with the robot's soft body. How interdisciplinary does this work need to be, using tools from robotics and applying them to medicine? Uh, for this, we need engineers, scientists, biologists, medical doctors, all working together to understand the physiological environment that the robot needs to navigate and function, and also how to design and build these very new devices and robots, and at the end, how to apply them in clinical problems with doctors in a way that no other medical device technology currently can solve such clinical problems. And how big a difference do you think these robots could make to how we conduct medicine? So these robots, because of their salt body, they can navigate in complex regions of our body uh, with no problem. And safety wise, uh, again, their salt body will not cause any damages. But also a very important aspect of these soft devices is because of shape deformations, they can have many other functions like delivering drugs when you want on demand. They can change the shape in a way that they can inject a drug in a very controlled way in the target location, or they can do biopsy or they can open a blood uh, vessel if it is clogged. So all of these functions can be also enabled because of its shape, body, shape and salt body deformations. Well, for somebody who's not deep into the issue as I am, uh, it sounds a bit like science fiction, I must admit, but uh, in fact, this is a very promising field of technology, right? Yeah, this, um, this is one example of uh, using soft robots with the aim of medical applications, but there, there are many others. Lots of researchers looking at this question, um, whether robotics can uh, make a huge difference to medicine and particularly this new field of soft robots, which, yeah, which look quite bizarre the first time you see them. Okay, yes, um, well, let's see what, what impact might this have on, on our future, especially in the health uh, field. Yes, uh, so if you speak to anyone working in soft robotics, you hear about countless applications. I, I mean, we just heard about, for example, biopsies, surgeries, drug delivery. Um, when and whether these applications would arrive, it's very hard for us to answer. But certainly the researchers working in this field have, uh, have very high amb ambitions and feel like it could absolutely revolutionize how we do medicine today. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay, so let's continue with our next winner. And this is Alessio Figali, ETH Zurich. He is aiming to break the wall to optimal transport. And uh, I'm asking Joel, what does the jury say about this project? Well, it seems that there is a little technical problem. Um, I'm yeah. back. Oh, you're back. Okay. <laughs> so what's the judgment of the jury about this project? So, sorry, I lost you for a while. So we are about Figali? Uh, yes. Uh, I just introduced Alessio Figali with his breakthrough to optimal transport. What does the jury say? I couldn't hear you. We are on Figali now? Yes, exactly. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Alessio Figali's yeah. fundamental contributions to the theory of optimal transport are the foundation for a better understanding of natural phenomena and have real-world applications in areas like urban planning and meteorology. Okay, thank you, Joel. We are trying to fix the line and we want to learn more about this project. Here comes the video. Breaking the wall to optimal transport. 
Alessio Figali, ETH Zurich. So I've been uh, working for many years on optimal transport. So this is a field where uh, essentially your goal is to move uh, at least, let's say some material from one place to another in the most efficient way, cheapest possible way. And this is a field which existed now for almost 200 years, but uh, after having been applied a lot to uh, urban planning, economics, and a lot of natural applications, actually uh, what uh, we have been realizing as mathematicians is that this theory could be pushed much forward. And in particular, my contribution has been to apply optimal transport to study uh, crystals, to study meteorology, actually, the movement of clouds. And even probably more surprisingly, optimal transport has application to machine learning. And that's also an area where I'm, I've been giving uh, contributions in the last few years. Where does this mathematical problem, the optimal transport problem, come from in the first place? Originally, the optimal transport problem was proposed by Gaspar Monge. We are at the end of the 18th century. So it was really a matter of, uh, you know, moving uh, material across Europe and building fortifications in the most efficient way. So even though this has been around for quite some time, you're still finding these new applications for it. How much of that requires building new theoretical underpinnings and how much is taking what we already have and finding how it applies to different situations? There is a lot of new developments that are needed here. We have to think that after Monge, nothing happened for almost 150 years. It was in the 1940s that Kantorovic um, started really to understand optimal transport from a more modern point of view, I would say. And actually Kantorovic was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics and it has always been discovering new stuff. So we couldn't really ne never uh, rely on previous work. So for you, are there, are there new situations you think it might be applicable to that you're, you're still working on? Optimal transport is a concrete problem originally, right? You want to move distributions of mass from one place to another. But then if you start to think as a mathematician, you can start to become more abstract. And then you can think that, you know, the same way I can transport material, I can transport abstract objects like pixels. So then I have a picture on one side and another picture on the other side, and I can try to understand how to transport, so move the pixel from one configuration to another. And, uh, you know, this is probably a baby cartoon, but that's the abstraction that uh, you need. And that's where mathematics really kicks in, in abstracting things. How much of the joy you get from the work is the fundamental mathematics, and how much would you say is these dreams of applications in the, in the real world? Well, I mean, a mathematician in heart. So I think uh, probably uh, I have a lot of joy from the abstract mathematics because it's really this, you know, universal robust theory that is behind everything. And it has been very important in the past that pure mathematics existed by itself. Because if you only look at applications, then you get short-sighted. You don't see the big picture. And without the big picture, you will never make breakthrough. Do you have a dream for the impact the optimal transport problem might actually be able to have on the wider world? Well, I think uh, if someone had told me in the past that optimal transport would have had application even to meteorology, you know, I would not have thought about that. And uh, so I'm happy as long as what I do has an impact to society because I think, uh, you know, that's what scientists do and that's our goal, you know, to understand science, understand nature, and at the same time, you know, bring something good. And I will just try to get, you know, inspired by the new challenges that uh, society will bring to us. The subject our next winner is dealing with is responsive biomedical systems. I'm glad to announce Simone Schürle, ETH Zürich. She presents a breakthrough in the context of inefficient drug delivery. Joel, what's the reason for the jury to decide for her? So... Robotics and medicine made an, a promising couple. Simone Schürle's approach with magnetically steered micro robots could be a breakthrough for drug delivery in a human body, and that in not uh, in in a not so distant future. Okay, let's get more on this and watch the video. Breaking the wall of inefficient drug delivery. Simone Schürle, ETH Zurich. I'm an engineer at training and my goal and aim is to control tiny robots that can roam through the body to detect and treat disease. 
Now, one particular problem I'm working on is um, how to effectively deliver drugs to tumor sites without harming the, uh, the rest of the body. And it turns out nature is already part of the solution for us. So there are bacteria that can be used as living therapeutics because they can follow cues of cancer, such as low oxygen levels, where they can actually grow and amplify and deliver drugs. But they have trouble getting into the tumors. And this, this is where we break down walls because we leverage living therapeutics by combining them with the power of magnetism. So we work with a special strain that can sense magnetic fields. And once they are at a tumor site, we apply rotational magnetic fields that is overriding their natural propulsion. And these me mechanical torques can help them to get out of vessels and better into tumor tissue. And we can even uh, control whole swarms of bacteria with that approach and generate large volumetric flows that can drag in nanotherapeutics with them, or we can attach them to their membrane like little backpacks. And with that approach, we aim to boost uh, drug delivery for cancer and other diseases. Now, this idea of using a swarm of bacteria to, de to deliver the drugs uh, might sound quite far-fetched, but I, this is something you have shown at least can work in theory. Yeah, so we do uh, computational modeling, um, but also we showed this in actually tiny, basically tumor tissues that we can grow on a chip. So we haven't shown this yet in, um, in vivo, of course, so we still have uh, a way to go. And of course, we have to do first do our thorough studies. Um, and we, yes, we, can, we have shown this um, through computational simulations as well as on little experimental platforms where we try to mimic these conditions that we encounter in the body. What safety checks do you need to make before this could be something that we can use for the treatment of diseases like cancer? So we try to hop on basically already on um, approved approaches. So there are, for example, nano capsules um, that are already approved and clinically used. And there is actually there are also clinical trials now with bacteria, probiotic ones. So these are not magnetic, uh, but they are probiotic bacteria that we can actually tolerate in the blood. And now we basically combine them with magnetic material to then make them respond to magnetic fields. So with that, we basically lower the barrier by already building up on existing approaches. But we then first have to show this, of course, in there are then animal trials to do, which come really at a late point because we, we first want to do the math, do the experiments on, on basically um, platforms where we don't harm uh, animals. And, and then we show this in, in animals and then move into clinical trials. How much does this work rely on lessons from different scientific disciplines? Oh, a lot. So this is really a melting pot. Uh, convergence of science is what, what happens here. So in my team, I really have mechanical engineers, bioengineers, chemical engineers, physicists, material scientists, um, and that's all uh, coming together. And that is also where I think a lot of new approaches can emerge. So here also with, with um, bacteria as living therapeutics, we work closely with synthetic biologists that can engineer also these bacteria to make them more tolerable in the human body, to uh, produce certain toxins, but they cannot control them uh, where they can go. And this is where the mechanical engineers or, or me as, a, as an engineer come in. <laughs> well, Adam, what are you taking away from this? I think it really shows us a, a lesson that applies to all science and technology, which is why reinvent the wheel when nature has uh, created magnetically sensitive bacteria, why, why build a robot from scratch to, do, to <laughs> tackle the same problem? Oh, we can do both. <laughs> why yeah. not? Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's go from bacteria to battery. Our next winner is using nanotechnology to build novel batteries. I'm glad to announce Yi Kui, Stanford University. He's aiming to break the wall to efficient batteries. What does the jury say about this, Joel? Well, we know that efficient batteries are critical for powering electric cars and storing solar and wind electricity for the grid integration. And here, Yi Kui's nanotechnology based materials design allows for new batteries with a two to three times higher energy density than the existing ones. This is a, a major impact. Okay, let's learn more and watch the video. Breaking the wall to efficient batteries. Yi Choi. Stanford University. So I have been trying to break the walls of uh, efficient batteries by 
using new materials and nanotechnology, I hope to achieve much high energy density batteries, and which we already did, a very long cycle life, and low cost batteries. And using nanotechnology can help designing the materials in a very small land scale to make it possible you can charge, discharge over many, many cycles, you know, up to thousands, 10,000 cycles. Now, a big concern with battery technology is its sustainability and, and the resources that it depletes. D does your approach do anything to address this concern? I am uh, very aware of uh, the uh, resources constraint. For example, current lithium ion batteries using cobalt. And uh, I have been working on a new ca cathode that's cobalt free uh, using sulfur, very low cost, abundant materials. Uh, that can have uh, much higher energy density. Now, why is it so important today that we build more advanced batteries? The reason is storing energy is probably one of the most important things to the whole clean energy landscape. You know, you uh, store energy inside the batteries that can enable electric cars a lot better, having more cars coming onto the street. And also the solar cell and the wind electricity, they don't, they are not available all the time. They need to be integrated into the electrical grid in a very stable fo uh, form. And having energy storage such as batteries is so important to help integration of wind and solar electricity. How does it feel after years of working on these batteries to now be starting to see them go out and uh, enter the market and be used for actual applications. It's absolutely great to see the chemistry, the new technology we have been working on, uh, starting from the lab and uh, generating the scientific breakthrough nowadays become the real product. The, the feeling is just fantastic. We know to stop climate change, we need to transition to clean energy. From your perspective, what could accelerate that transition? Adam, this is a great question. So I think number one is extremely important for government, every country, United States, Germany, you know, China, India, Japan, and many, many countries to really strongly support the uh, science and technology, research and development of clean energy, and uh, encourage uh, innovation of that, that's the first one. And the second one will be for the young people, for the existing researchers, don't be afraid to explore new ideas and really going into these areas uh, of clean energy to work hard, to innovate, to make an impact. Uh, uh, we uh, don't have too much time left uh, before CO2 level gets uh, to very high level, the global warming is happening in a really global scale. If you want to dive a bit deeper, you have the great chance to talk to the winners directly in our Q&A session, which starts at 3.15 immediately after our next session. So don't miss that one. Let's see the jury's decision about our next winner. I'm delighted to announce Frank Stefan Tautz, Forschungszentrum Jülich. He is aiming to break the wall of building with molecules. Joel, what's the reason for the of the jury? Yes, Astrid. So the, the fabrication of molecules at the nanoscale is extremely challenging because their behavior is hard to predict and molecules defy intuitive handling. Franz Stefan Tautz presents a pioneering way to leverage AI for the autonomous fabrication of molecules. Thank you, Joel. Here comes the interview with Adam. Breaking the wall of building with molecules. Frank Stefan Tautz, Forschungszentrum Jürich. Imagine a world in which bricks and other building materials are all abundantly available, but nobody knows how to build houses with them. And this is in fact the strange situation we are in regarding molecules, because in the last 200 years, chemists have learned 
how to synthesize almost any conceivable molecule, but we don't know how to build with them. That is, to arrange them carefully, one by one, with atomic precision, to build functional structures. And in our research, for some time, we are striving to get a grip on molecules, literally, so that we can realize in the world of molecules the uh, manufacturing paradigm, which is so powerful in the macroscopic world. Now, there has been some work building with individual atoms. Why is it so hard to build then with, with molecules, which after all, they're just collections of atoms? Yes, uh, I always say it's a bit like the difference between uh, playing soccer and uh, watchmaking, because an atom, of course, is a very simple spherical entity, and you can just push it around uh, like you can kick a soccer ball. But of course, if you have more complicated filigrane elements um, like molecules, this becomes much more difficult. Now, I understand to overcome the problem of building with molecules, you employed artificial intelligence. What does AI have to do with building with molecules? There are two aspects to this. The first aspect is the one which we used in this recent work, where we uh, have uh, given the control over the a microscope over the robot to a neural network which executed the work for us. The second aspect is, of course, one would like to see what is happening, what the robot is doing while it is doing it. And since we cannot see molecules because they are so small, we can only record data. And this is actually quite a big amount of data. So we talk about big data. And to make sense of this and translate it into a picture of what's going on, which can then also maybe be used uh, in virtual reality rendering, we also need artificial intelligence. Just how much time and effort has it taken you to get to the stage you're at today? Well, we've been working on this molecular manipulation uh, for at least 10 years. And uh, many generations of PhD students have, have done their PhD thesis in this field. And it has always started more or less uh, by chance when we uh, studied uh, this molecule here, which uh, I show you, and we just tried to image it sitting on the surface. And when we actually scanned the tip, the sharp metal needle of our microscope across this molecule, we uh, found that whenever the tip was close to this oxygen atom here in the corner, uh, it would bond, it would jump up and bond to the tip. And um, yeah, this then we studied in detail and more and more we developed this into a platform for molecular manipulation. Now that it seems like you actually have achieved this, you can build with molecules, what are you hoping you might be able to fabricate? There is a field, for example, of molecular electronics. People have dreamed for a long time uh, about making logic and memory circuits uh, for computers from molecules because you could design chemically let's say a transistor and then the problem is to arrange all these transistors in a controlled way to embed them in the environment and it i mean the methods which we develop could help us to achieve this well adam what does it mean to combine artificial intelligence and nanotechnology well, I, I think a few years ago it would have been quite an unexpected combination, but now we're just seeing artificial intelligence across the in, entire domain of science, research, technology. And yeah, it's fascinating to see uh, what complete unexpected, at, at least unexpected for me, applications it ends up having. Mm -hmm. Let's see what's coming up next. We are jumping to Hong Kong. And our next winner is focusing on breaking the wall to save high-energy and eco-friendly batteries. I'm delighted to introduce Yi Chung Lu from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So, Joel, what was the reason for the jury to vote for this project? Yes, we all know that lithium-ion batteries used in electrical vehicles, consumer electronics, they are both flammable and toxic. So, Yun Chung Lun has developed a new battery type on the basis of a non-toxic polymer that promises to overcome the limits of current battery technology. Okay, let's have a look at this presentation. Breaking the wall of safe energy storage. Yi Chen Lu the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Commercial lithium-ion batteries 
plays a critical role in our daily life, from cell phone, laptop to electric vehicle. Unfortunately, it's toxic and flammable. Imagine when everyone is driving an EV and using big battery at home, we are essentially surrounding us with potential bumps. Our research addressed this issue. We developed water-based, inherently safe medium for battery to operate. With this technology, we no longer need to worry about battery fires, and we can use it freely anywhere with car, homes, and large-scale storage to further expand to electromobility for safe energy storage. We developed battery prototypes that can allow fast refilling for electric vehicles without waiting for charging and better integration with renewable energy. Now, in a lot of ways, this seems like a very intuitive, maybe even obvious thing to, to replace the solution with a water-based solution so that it's less flammable. But can you explain why this is actually quite a tricky thing to do? The challenge is that the water-based battery cannot produce voltage that is greater than 2 volts, which is impractical for a lot of important applications. So therefore, that's how PEG came in, the polymer that we invented to stabilize the water. And therefore, it will not decompose and will give us greater voltage to use. We hear about a lot of different battery innovations over the years. What will it take to actually uh, take what you have today and get it into an electric vehicle, for example? Uh, it would be probably uh, another one or two years of exper experimentation and also verification because the liquid electrolyte, the liquid medium, is used also uh, in all different types of battery. Uh, well, we don't have to change the infrastructure of the battery. All we need is to drop in the solution um, and then we will have a non-flammable battery. Beyond uh, being a better battery for existing applications, can you imagine any new applications for your safer battery? I think uh, one application or one type of application really also need a uh, safe battery is for biomedical application. Uh, one thing, uh, for example, like a pacemaker, they may be need to be powered by batteries and at, a, at this type of application if we have really safe battery um, without toxic chemicals would also be very helpful. Just how big an impact do you hope your battery could have on the world and on the fight against climate change? I hope this battery and this chemistry will allow us to use massive renewable energy without hesitation. Uh, we all know solar and wind are great ideas and we, right now, we cannot reliably use it because we need to store them. And to store massive of energy without risk of fire, that is very challenging. So I really hope that our technology will enable massive renewable energy storage without fire risk. And so this will really help people to willing uh, to use more renewable energy and use even in their cars and everything. So I think that is my dream and I hope this will come true. Adam, this is already our second breakthrough on batteries today. So why is this field so interesting for engineers? Well, it's, it's such an important topic. We're in a situation now where we know our future is going to depend quite heavily on battery technology. And at the same time, we can see very clearly the limitations of today's batteries, both in terms of capacity, safety, environmental impact. And so uh, the innovations we, we get on battery technology really can't come fast enough. Mm -hmm. OK, let's see what the decision of the jury is about our next winner. It is Christian Koos, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany. And he is aiming to break the wall towards ultra broadband signal processing. So what was so decisive for the jury about this, Joel? Yes, Astrid. So modern communication relies on the generation, detection and processing of electromagnetic signals. And Christian Kors has pushed the boundaries of current electronics by combining electronics with photonics. And his approach unlocks a wealth of applications from ultra fast data communications, but also to material analysis. 
Thank you. Let's get more information about this in our net next uh, video. Breaking the wall towards ultra-broadband signal processing. Christian Kurs, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT. So our research breakthrough is about ultra-broadband signal processing. So generation, detection and processing of signals is one of the most important technical foundations of modern society. We use it for communicating, we use it for measuring things in the lab, like behind me. We use it for medical diagnostics. The, con the conventional way of doing that is to use electronic circuits, where electrons flow and represent the signal. And that works very well. It's just a little bit slow or it's limited in bandwidth, as engineers would say. And our idea is to overcome that by combining electronic circuits with optical circuits where photons flow and represent signals or photons is an equivalent of light waves. It's just like in, 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 in glass fiber cables today, uh, you can transmit huge amount of data by using optical signals. And we are basically using the same technology base. So the idea is to first define our signals in the optical domain and then to merge different optical signals to generate one very broadband electronic waveform. So normally electronic circuits can go up to a few tens of gigahertz. Uh, our approaches can bring us to beyond that. We can go to hundreds of gigahertz to maybe a terahertz. So that's a factor of 10 roughly. Just to, to, to give a comparison, yeah? these signals, they vary on a time scale of a picosecond or of a few picoseconds. And the picosecond is, a really, is really short. If you would look at it in slow motion, you would um, stretch a picosecond to say a second than what was before a second would turn into 30,000 years. So that's, that's, that's fairly long or the picosecond is, is very short. Can you give a sense of how you're actually able to achieve these incredibly rapid variations in the signal? Mm -hmm. So what we do is we start from optical signals. So normally we would generate two optical signals or more of them. And if we superimpose them, we see a bead. So what we essentially do is we use optical signals that have even higher frequencies. And then we generate the terahertz signals by, by the beats. And by using many optical signals and by modulating them in an appropriate way, we can generate a broadband waveform um, that we can digitally design. For many, this might sound somewhat theoretical, but you actually have one application in mind which maybe all of us could end up using. One of the challenges that we will face in the future is that we have to connect many devices to the internet, not just smartphones and tablets, but also cars, bicycles, traffic lights, and that means what we need is very small radio cells that can serve this high density of users. And those cells, um, they, they must be connected to each other and to the internet backbone. And that might be done through line of sight terahertz links. And there, our technology could be used, for example, to really provide broadband connectivity for many devices. What stage are you at today? And what would it take to, to take your innovation and actually get it to a stage where, where we are using it to communicate with devices all around the world? Behind me, you can see such a setup that works, but it has some problems. And one of the problems is that this is far too large and far too expensive to be actually used. So what we need to do is we need to make this much smaller. And the way to do this is we want to integrate all these devices onto, onto tiny optical microchips. And those can fit into small packages that will dramatically bring down the power consumption and that will make it much more viable, viable and usable as the systems are today. This innovation isn't just about uh, better communication, there would also be research applications. What you maybe are familiar with is NMR. This is a technique that looks at the spin resonances of atomic nuclei. We can do the same thing with electrons. Uh, this gives us different insight into the material, and that's where our technology can be used, for example, to generate certain pulse shapes that can excite or that can detect spin resonance patterns of electrons. So we have presented to you already nine stunning breakthroughs here in this category. This is the last one now. I'm happy to present Teodoro Laino, IBM Research Europe Zurich. His work is on breaking the wall of chemistry. And I'm asking the jury what was most convincing for you, Joel. Yes, Astrid, we heard a lot about materials, new materials, new molecules but it takes usually years to bring a new material to market. Theodoros Lino's research accelerated the design of new molecules and materials via the combination of AI, cloud computation, and automation. So in a sense, every location becomes a laboratory. <laughs> Let's learn more about this and watch the video.
Breaking the wall of chemistry. Teodoro Lino, IBM Research Europe, Zurich. So the breakthrough innovation is about transforming chemistry from uh, a traditional type uh, of uh, business science into an high tech business or an high tech science. We have been introducing digitalization, which means artificial intelligence across the entire chain of synthetic chemistry coupled with uh, robotics. How does this use of artificial intelligence and robotics change from the conventional way of conducting chemistry? Chemistry is a science that has been basically done in a similar way in the last 200 years. We are running today in chemical laboratories protocols exactly as they were run 100 years ago. Artificial intelligence will have a big impact on chemistry and this project is just about accelerating that impact. What's it like to actually use this um, robotic artificial intelligent lab, especially use it remotely? So the experience for a remote usage is, user is actually like uh, viewing an assistant that decides what to mix, when to change the temperature, and how, what type of operation to perform in the environment. And you can, you can watch that movie actually uh, remotely. Now, are you hoping this just makes the process of chemistry a lot more convenient, or could it actually unlock new applications? The use of artificial intelligence model is actually capable of using the, the knowledge that has been learned by a large uh, corpus of uh, uh, humanly collected information to come up with original ideas. And how far have you got with this innovation so far? Uh, what have you been able to create with it today? We have an example uh, internally where we have uh, applied the, the entire asset of artificial intelligence model, including robotics, for designing and making materials uh, that are uh, efficient in capturing uh, the CO2 from the atmosphere. And at the same time, we are working also for using this technology to produce new molecules not commercially available for possible use as antivirals for uh, the COVID-19. Now, if my experience of chemistry when I was 15 is anything to go by, uh, things can often go wrong. Um, how, how do you make sure this is safe, especially when it's being operated remotely? We have collected 700,000 uh, chemical procedures, and they look very similar uh, to in structure, to the procedures, to the recipes, cooking recipes. Uh, these are all procedures that are actually very, uh, very important uh, in order to uh, come up with a series of instructions that guarantee the safety. Why is this innovation particularly important today in 2020? Uh, there is the necessity for uh, lots of people uh, to work remotely. Uh, we found in uh, uh, people studying chemistry that several universities in the United States that were not able to have physical synthetic chemistry laboratories, they decided to introduce the learning of digital tools for chemical synthesis, and they did it using uh, the technology that we made freely available. So for today, that was it. You have met our top 10 winners in the category engineering and technology and their stunning projects. So congratulations to all the winners and good luck for your work, your projects. Uh, it's just incredible what we have seen today. So tomorrow we will continue our celebrations uh, in our Falling Walls Grand Final. We will honor the 10 very best breakthroughs of the year 2020 through all categories. And I'm looking forward very much to it. Adam, do you actually know who it's going to be? I, I don't, actually. I've heard a rumor about one category, but nine are complete guesses for me. Me neither. And, yeah, I, just looking at each category, I, I don't envy the, the judges who've had to make these decisions. Right, uh, yeah, that's true. You will join me tomorrow. Looking forward to this. Uh, at this point, I would like to thank very much uh, Joel Messor from Zurich, who was joining us. He was the jury chair of this session. I have to apologize for some little instabilities in line we had in the beginning, but I'm glad that we could fix the line in the end. Thank you so much, Joel, for being with us. Thank you. So.
Uh, we will continue now with our next winner's session in the category Science Engagement right after this show. And I hope to see you again. Stay tuned, stay with us. See you soon. Hello, everybody, again. Welcome to our last winner's sessions with the breakthroughs of the year 2020. I'm looking forward to explain you more about this. My name is Astrid Fulov. I'm a TV moderator, and I'm guiding you through this session. Well, in the last uh, session today, we will present the top 10 winners and their stunning science breakthroughs in the category science engagement. <music> Well, this is our category, science engagement. Uh, I'm glad to introduce to you Adam Levy, who is joining me in the studio. He's a science journalist and a physicist, and I'm glad that you're here with me, Adam. Also, I have the great pleasure to introduce to you online the jury chair of this category, science engagement. This is Melanie Smallman, a lecturer in science and technology studies and co-director of the new Center for Science Communication at, at UCL. Great to have you joining us, Melanie. So let me uh, join you. tell you that uh, Melanie is a uh, chair of the jury who was uh, looking uh, for the 10 best uh, breakthroughs in this category. Here you see all their names and all their pictures, and we are very grateful for their work. I guess it was indeed a very difficult decision. So, Melanie, um, it seems that the perception of science in the public is doing well when we look at how countries like Germany were able, able to navigate the pandemic. Uh, on the other hand, there is a lot of mistrust and misinformation in many places on Earth. What's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it's an important point because it hasn't been handled quite as well everywhere. And I think politicians, policymakers and citizens have been often quite confused about the science. And I think, you know, it's our job to clear that up and to communicate effectively, but also realize that there is misinformation um, and fake news and to try and think not really just about where that's coming from and what it's about, but why is that kind of misinformation making more sense or resonating better with people than the real science? And I don't think we know the answer to that. I suspect that it's something to do with science not being for them or perhaps the kind of future we're talking about people feeling left behind from. But I think it's really important that we get to understand what's happening with all of this misinformation. Right. And in the light of this, uh, how important is science engagement and what does it depend on, actually? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that is vitally important. We've seen how important it is for make, understanding the science so that we as citizens, but also policymakers, can be better prepared to make decisions when things like um, unexpected pandemics come about. Um, 
And I think it's a two way thing. It isn't just about, of course, there's a role about providing information and educating people. But I think it's really important as well that we listen and that we listen um, to, to those people who feel that science isn't for them so that we can maybe find a better way of engaging with them in the future and making sure that they're not left behind when it's like we've seen this year unfold. OK. Thank you so far. Uh, I'll come back to you, Mel Melanie, but let me first uh, ask Adam. Adam, you are a science communicator yourself. You're a YouTube blogger on climate change issues. Uh, what do you think is the role of science engagement? Well, I think uh, what Melanie said is incredibly important, this idea that um, for, for many, science doesn't appear to be for them. I think we often think about science engagement just as spreading facts and spreading information, but I think it's much more than that. It's showing people that science doesn't exist up some ivory tower or buried in some lab, um, and scientists aren't strange people living in some faraway land. They're, <laughs> they're people like anyone else, and um, science is a, a process like any other. So let's see what breakthroughs are coming up in this uh, context. Have, let's have a look at the top 10 list. Uh, here comes the first winner. And this is Ken Dutton Register, Excite Science. He is aiming to breaking the wall of cancer education. Melanie, why did the jury decide for him and his project? Well, I mean, we thought it's such an important topic, educating people about cancer, how they can detect it and how hopefully um, they can prevent it. But Ken was taking a really special approach to it. Um, he was using the idea of an escape room, which uh, if you've been in, uh, you'd know how much fun it is. But really, a lot of people just liked the way that he was taking something innovative and fun, but with a really serious and important message. Okay, we're excited to learn more about this. Here comes the video. Breaking the wall of cancer education. Ken Dutton Register, Excite Science. Yeah, so cancer affects millions of people worldwide, but with a disease that's you know so complex, how do we teach people about it? So as a cancer researcher of over 12 years, I've sort of found that most people tend to sort of learn about cancer through text-based information. And this information is more geared towards an audience that are personally affected with cancer. Now, the problem with this is that, you know, it's not really engaging and we're missing out on a big chunk of the population. So to break through this wall of uh, cancer education, I decided to create the world's first cancer biology themed escape room. Now, escape rooms are an amazing communication platform because they're so immersive. And in this experience, players have to go into a room and solve a series of puzzles in a defined set of time. And so we've used this platform as a way to transport people inside the human body. And we've designed puzzles to talk about how cancer occurs and why it's difficult to treat. Now, because our room is portable and accessible, uh, we've engaged over 7,000 people and have popped up in locations, you know, such as conference centers all the way to the beachside. Um, and now other organizations are using our room in a variety of different formats. And so with this room, we think we can have a real impact in teaching people about cancer, cancer globally and really reinforce the preventative behavior strategies that people can use uh, to reduce their risk of cancer over a lifetime. And can you describe what your audience actually looks like? Are escape rooms something that only really appeal to, I guess, younger crowds? Yeah, so the statistics sort of show that most people that do an escape room are under the age of 40. And that's definitely the type of audience that we tend to attract. I mean, we've popped up in multiple different locations, but most of the time it's probably like 10 to 15 year olds that are super excited jumping up and down. They've seen what an escape room is on YouTube, but they've never done one before. And this is their first chance to do it um, all the way to people that have done an escape room before and want to try something new. Do you have any maybe favorite stories of, of how the escape room has impacted an audience member? Yeah, so I think the first one was the, the a couple of 10 year olds who paid $5 out of their own pocket, uh, just so excited to do the room and they donated that money to cancer research. Um, but we've also had some really serious um, situations occur as well. So I remember the first day that we launched the room, we had someone who was uh, unfortunately diagnosed with breast cancer two weeks prior. She didn't really know much about what it was. And by the end of the experience, she was just so ecstatic to sort of 
know and be empowered about what her disease was. It was a really moving moment. Are there other ways you're hoping to explore cancer education in the future? Yeah, so we're really deep into trying and experimenting different techniques. And so this previous year, we launched a virtual reality game on the Oculus Quest system. And moving forward, we're now designing a new project, which is a art gallery, also portable, but also uses augmented reality and adaptive soundtracks. So we're really leaning heavy into this sort of technology physical combination and using ways that surprise people to attract people in. What are you hoping is the lasting impact of your escape room on, on your audience? Yeah, well, I think escape rooms are incredibly memorable. And so particularly for those people that are doing an escape room for the first time, I really see there's this generation of people doing this escape room. And every time they think of an escape room, they're thinking back to this experience that teaches them about cancer in that educational setting. And if we can effectively reinforce those preventative health behaviors, I'm hoping that over time we can reduce the risk of cancer incident um, purely by helping people reduce their risk of cancer. Well, Adam, I think creativity plays an important role in communicating science, right? Yeah, I think uh, one of the essential things about science communication is there's no one right way of communicating science. Different audiences need different types of communication. And I, I think for something as important as cancer, we need every approach we can get. And so using something as, uh, as unique as an escape room is a really fascinating approach. Yeah. The next winner the jury was voting for is Sofia Otero, who is exploring the world of volcanoes. She is aiming to break the wall to energy trapped in the earth. So I'm asking the jury what was uh, so decisive for you to vote for her. So this was an exciting project where um, she's taking a traveling exhibition around and taking people on a journey to the center of a volcano using virtual reality. So we really liked how creative and innovative this was. It was using new technology, but also that it was taking the science to where citizens and people were. So not expecting them to come and visit a museum or somewhere which we love. Um, but we were also struck by how relevant the project was for the, the country where it's situated. So it's in Chile, where, you know, maybe in Northern Europe, we don't worry about volcanoes, but in other parts of the world, they're very real things that people are concerned about. So again, another project that had um, significant impact. So let's get an idea of how this looks like. Here comes a video. wall to energy trapped in the earth. Sofia Otero, Andean Geothermal Center of Excellence. In Chile, even though we have like 2,000 volcanoes, we're not really aware that we have so many. And we are not aware about all the benefits and also the dangers of living in a volcanic nature. So we wanted to break through the walls of energy trapped inside the earth by creating an exhibition that will make people aware of our volcanic nature. We really need uh, other ways of creating energy in this country. We have the biggest untapped geothermal potential of the world, and we are not aware of that. So that is why we created this exhibition, Journey to the Center of the Volcano, looking forward to engage younger audiences, people who is in a process of opinion forming, about the place we live in. So that's why we did this exhibition. Now, of course, a, a challenge with science engagement is often getting people to actually attend the science engagement. How do you overcome this hurdle with this project? Well, because we installed the exhibition in a subway station, so it was pretty visible for everyone that was moving around the city. They'll just see this giant ship <laughs> over there they wanted to know what it, what it was so people just approach us and that will make it quite visible we try to be where people is during the day rather than calling people to visit us we'll go where people is in public spaces how are you hoping that this volcano experience impacts your audience in the long term we hope that people will start kind of uh, awakening about what our territory can give us. Uh, we are not really connected to territory because nowadays, even more because of all, all of the screens where we consume the world through. 
So we're disconnected from nature and we would like that this exhibition will help to trigger more internal reflections and creating new opinions of what does it mean to live in a country like this one with so many volcanoes. Why is it so important that Chileans learn about volcanoes? We need to awaken inside us uh, what our territory really means to us and how the territory, um, our nature, also build the way we are and what is our potential as a country and how are we going to evolve in a sustainable way. So our territory gives us everything to be sustainable, to be green. And we think of volcanoes like this big danger that we have and it really gives us a lot more than that. It gives us energy, it gives us a lot of touristic spots, it gives us good agriculture, it gives us minerals which we live from. So we're not aware of all of that. And we need to know what we have in order to love what you have. Well, Adam, I'm wondering uh, how do scientists regard the relevance of communicating science? Uh, is there a shift? I do think there has been something of a shift. I, I know we and, and myself can talk about this notion of the ivory tower and the scientist in the lab, but I think more and more scientists are seeing communication of science as an essential part of, of their work and uh, want, want to spread the word about the work that they're doing. Mm -hmm. So let's see who is our next winner. I'm glad to announce uh, Robert Arlinghaus, Humboldt Universität zu Berlin. And uh, he is trying to break the wall to sustainable fisheries. Melanie, what is the judgment of the jury? Yeah, so this was a really um, unusual project in one sense that the audience was um, anglers and people doing thought that was a niche audience. But at the same time, this wasn't a straightforward one way communication project. What we really liked about it is that Robert's working with um, the fishers to actually use their local knowledge of those water ecosystems into his research on sustainable fisheries. So it was really two way communication. And that's what made um, this project stand out for the jury. OK, let's watch the interview Adam took earlier. Breaking the wall to sustainable fisheries. Robert Arlinghaus. Humboldt University of Berlin. Well, many problems of our times in terms of sustainability depend really on, on the behavior of people, how they respond towards the environment. And it's really hard to change people's behavior so they become more sustainable in their, in their use of the environment. In my project, we broke the wall that we engaged with users of natural resources, in our case, recreational anglers. These are people that fish for recreation and we engaged them in joint experiments. So rather than telling them passively what science found out, we actually completed experiments together with them, how they can improve the fish stocks, how they can increase the biodiversity at the lakes and rivers, how they can improve their own behavior to be more um, caring with the fish that they handle. And we did this over multiple years, planning the experiments together, evaluating the outcomes, and this increases the competencies and the acceptability of research results substantially. And this is also what we could show empirically that the anglers really raised their knowledge and they changed their behavior towards the environment. And I think that's a quite an interesting approach. And what were you actually researching together with these fishers and these anglers? Well, we are actually doing uh, research on sustainable fisheries. So you can imagine that if you exploit a local fish lake or, or, or river, that if you take too many fish out, then the fish stocks will decline and there will be a series of issues. Anglers respond to this by, for example, introducing new fish. It's a practice called stocking. And this is very controversial because it's full of risks that you can actually introduce diseases, foreign genes, and other things. So we actually evaluated the practice of fish stocking together. We marked fish, we evaluate the outcomes over multiple years in multiple lakes. And therefore, this um, helped the anglers to actually identify conditions under which it works and under the conditions that it doesn't work. And this was a major outcome that we did. What has the impact of the work been so far? 
So the impact of the work can be traced at multiple levels. So first of all, I, there's a lot of examples of local change in practices where, for example, the fish stocking is done at a lower rate and alternatives are used more intensively. So there's ample of evidence that this has been happening throughout Germany in response to these projects. In addition, we have also seen changes at the fishing law level in several states where recommendations that we devised together were actually implemented into new legislation. And thirdly, our work was also um, designing recommendation at the international fishery policy level by, the, by being included in the technical guidelines for responsible recreational fisheries for the Food Environmental Organization of the United Nations. So you can really see changes happening from the local to the international scale. Are there lessons from what you've done that could be applied to science engagement in other, in other areas? What is important for science communication is that you achieve acceptability and trust among the people you want to work with. And often I see my colleagues kind of communicating more from a top-down approach where, you, where they have to... Um, where well, they have the perspective that they are the experts and then they transmit what they have found out. So I think a change in the yeah, general philosophy of how you approach people and you treat them at an eye level where you say there's scientific knowledge and there's non-scientific knowledge, both is valid and legitimate. And um, if you approach people like that, you can make a much greater impact of trust and therefore also joint learning. So this is maybe something that other science communication activities can work with. And we can see that uh, science engagement sometimes is a very long process, right? Yeah, and a very dynamic process. It needn't just be in the form of a, of a lecture, but uh, actually uh, engaging and conducting science simultaneously is, is clearly not only possible, but has real benefits. I am delighted to announce our next winner, and this is Susan Murabana Owen, who is going to break the wall with a traveling telescope. Uh, Melanie, what convinced the jury about this project? Well, we really like the simplicity of this project, where Susan is taking a telescope around uh, communities and schools. Um, and we just were impressed by how something as straightforward as that, or seemingly straightforward, was really inspiring awe and wonder amongst the audience and both trying to encourage the next generation of African scientists who um, inspired to try and build ecotourism in that part of Africa where the skies are much darker. So, we, yeah, we were just impressed by the simplicity and impact of this project. Let's see how this looks like. Here is the video. the wall of the traveling telescope. Susan Murabana Owen, the traveling telescope. Uh, my breakthrough approach is using science engagement and astronomy in particular to get people excited about uh, science and uh, their place in our unique planet really. And how are you actually bringing astronomy to, to your audiences? Uh, when I was in my 20s I got a chance to look through a telescope for the first time and to see Saturn floating and also mountains on the moon. And I was very impressed by that. And I wish that while I was in school learning about the solar system, I had that experience. So that uh, made me create a company called the Traveling Telescope uh, with the idea of taking a portable telescope and a mobile planetarium to schools and to get kids excited. But we've also now recently built a permanent planetarium out of bamboo. How does this compare with conventional science and astronomy education that kids might be getting uh, typically in Kenya? I think um, that most kids in Kenya do get to learn about astronomy in a theoretical way. So through the books and without having that practical uh, experience. But just giving them a chance, you know, just to look through a telescope and see the moon for the first time or to enter a planetarium and have the lesson in astronomy in that immersive world takes them to a different space. So we don't uh, think that uh, it's possible 
perhaps because these tools are not cheap, they're expensive. And also uh, we hope that we can spark the interest of you know, making it more practical, even just by looking at the dark and polluted skies that we have here and using that as an observing place to learn about astronomy. What do you hope will be the lasting impact of bringing space to these school kids? I think there are two things I'm hoping to achieve. And, and one is really for every kid to have a chance to look through a telescope at least once in their lifetime, because we hope that they'll have a better appreciation of the space in the universe. Um, and our, the uniqueness of our planet and what that means, even if they don't get into science, having that appreciation might help us be better people on Earth. The second thing is we have built a bamboo planetarium and we don't only want to be the ones to talk about protecting our environment, but want to demonstrate through our planetarium by using bamboo, which is environmentally friendly that we are doing it so that when kids come, they see that we are demonstrating as adults and as educators. Where do you hope to go with this project in the future? I hope that I can uh, first get every Kenyan kid to look through our telescope mm. and um, I hope that I can uh, move to other parts of Africa and just share our different culture and our different skies through astronomy. Adam, I'm wondering what about this project fascinates you as a physicist? I mean, personally, this project really resonates with my experience that took me into science, took me into physics. I think I was maybe 12 years old or something like that when I got to look through a telescope when really? I was on a holiday with my family. And yeah, it just blew me away. And so <laughs> hearing these descriptions of the impact it's having on, on these kids, um, yeah, it just really reminds me of what excited me about science in the first place. And I really, really hope it has the same impact on, <laughs> on a lot of the people who are getting to look through this telescope. Let's meet our next winner. I'm glad to announce Anil Pradhan, who is going to break the wall of unemployment. Melanie, what is the judgment of the jury? Yeah, we really like this project as well. Um, and I thought I think we thought it was inspiring and impressive. So what the project's doing is training young people to take on jobs in technology and science by helping them to solve problems that their community are facing. Um, and so we just really liked that dual function that it was both solving local problems and creating um, skills and competencies for these young people to go on to um, nicely paid jobs. Let's learn more and uh, watch the interview. Breaking the wall of unemployment. Anil Pradhan, Navunmesh Prasar Foundation. So my project is all about uh, employing the youths by uh, making them more skilled and making them prepare for the 21st century jobs. So we basically set up maker spaces and innovative schools across rural parts of India. In this project, we try to come up with solution, effective solution by which students, youths, dropouts can actually get into schools and they learn how to get them skilled and all that stuff. After they get skilled, they are employable. Can you give a sense of just how big a problem unemployment is in rural parts of India? Unemployability is the biggest problem in India. Like 94% of youths are unemployable. Reason being, they either don't have the skills to get a job or they are simply drop out from school. So this is a very big problem. And the solution to this problem is all about making them skilled and developing the skills from the very grassroots. This being in rural communities, how do you make sure that you uh, position this center in, in a place where people can actually access it? Like in India, we have 30 different states and we have around 200 plus local languages. So if we want to implement anything or if we want to take anything to the grassroots, then it is very difficult to convert all the content in these local languages. 
So what we do is we set up a small lab, which we call as the Toad Ford Jod lab. In Hindi, it is Toad Ford Jod, which means break, dismantle, and assemble. And through these kind of labs, we actually attract the youths and students, school students, to come down to these labs and do hands-on activity. So we have short-term and long-term courses. So students get enrolled here. After they get enrolled, they learn a lot of skills and then we help them get employment in companies across or else they can be become entrepreneurs who can help uplift their own community at the grassroots. What kind of skills can they actually learn? For example, they can learn welding, they can learn carpentry or anything like that, or they can learn skills like 3D printing, laser cutting, coding, uh, it can be as small as soldering or, uh, or or burning a microcontroller. And after completing courses that you offer, what are the employment options for, for students? Students can actually have two options. Either they can go for corporates, where they can go for jobs, which are readily available in the market, or they can become entrepreneurs and they can become employer to other unemployed youth across these uh, villages in India. Well, Adam, what impact does technology have on education in general? Well, I think uh, what we really see is that uh, science education, technology education, it, it's a wonderful thing in and of itself. But from a project like this, we, we see that it can actually completely transform the lives of, of the people that, uh, that are reached. Well, our next winner is going to break the wall of engagement in prison. I'm delighted to announce Mayuri Stewart, University of St. Andrews. So what did the jury like about this work, Melanie? Well, I think we were just so impressed that this project was very effectively reaching um, a group that really are outside society and very underserved. So they're going into prisons and working with the prisoners and their families um, to build together a curriculum about science and to support the prisoners in learning and developing new skills so that they're on their path to um, reconnecting with society when they finally um, leave prison. So it, it was just a very impressive project with um, a, a difficult to reach audience. Okay, thank you, Melanie. Let's have a look at the interview now. Breaking the wall of engagement in prisons. Very Stewart, University of St Andrews. We are trying to break the walls of science engagement in prisons. Now, prisons teach um, numeracy and literacy, and that's quite right. But STEM is so fundamental to how we live today that it's really important that that happens as well. So to do this, we have taken uh, researchers into prisons and we have facilitated them to deliver interactive sessions in blocks of eight sessions three times a year in learning centres and in family visiting centres. And this has been fabulously successful. We've met with 1,200 prisoners and their families in six different prisons. And we have, it, it's resulted in uh, some of our prison learners asking us for textbooks. They've been so interested in some of the subjects and saying, really importantly, saying that this has given them something massively positive to talk to their families about. And it's been positive for our researchers as well, because our researchers, many of them have said, called the experience transformational and have gone on to actually create um, prison interactions themselves outside of cell block science. Just how different is what you're bringing into these prisons from what would be available already to these prisoners? Well, it's unique, really, because researchers in prisons is not something new. Engagement in prisons is not something new. But what we have presented is a programme that has gone on for a period of time. Our prison learners have come to trust us. The prison authorities have come to trust us. And we've built this relationship with them that has allowed us to provide learning that they want, but also to give our researchers a platform that is unique and is 
just just really, really valued. What is the impact on these prisoners beyond the classroom? There's been a great deal of interest. So, for example, our learners have asked for textbooks. We provided, we provided um, informal libraries of science libraries, and we know that some of our learners have then asked for textbooks, which they've taken away to do self-learning on. In fact, one uh, learner he went through the physics textbook and found all the mistakes to send to the publisher. But that's a different subject. Um, and we know that the library is hugely valued as well because books are returned. <laughs> but beyond that, and within the teaching centres, the learning centres, we have actually been able to provide them with content that impacts both the literacy and numeracy delivery. And we have prison learners who have been creating uh, music and artwork based on what they've heard in, in our sessions. Where do you hope you can go with this project in the future? Well, I hope we can take it to more prisons. I hope we can take it outside of prisons, to communities outside of prisons. We've started doing that. We've been working with a homeless charity who actually have some connections with prison leavers as well. But I think really importantly, it's that work we're doing with the Scottish Qualifications Authority, who are interested in creating formal learning modules to be used in prison using our model of different subjects and standardised outputs. We have seen seven stunning breakthroughs so far in this category, and we're looking forward to present three more to you. Our next winner is Mohammed Dawood. He is aiming for breaking the wall to reaching the unreachable people in the countryside in Egypt. Melanie, what was convincing for the jury about this project? This project they've called Fun Lab, and they're taking a bus around Egypt with science experiments and equipment for uh, children and young people to try out and learn with. And we thought this was just really important because it was a very compelling and proactive way of taking science to school students who just wouldn't have access to that kind of learning and equipment. Um, and so that's what really impressed us about it. So let's have a look at this project. Here comes the video. Breaking the wall to reaching the unreachable. Mohammed Daoud, the Fun Lab. Our project is a mobile facility that uses the, our science bus to travel across the country to deliver science shows using the first of its kind mobile planetarium to reach to the underprivileged communities and refugees so we can spark their curiosity. In the past six years, the Fun Lab has reached more than one million uh, students across the country, covering almost all the governates of our country. And uh, we delivered more than 40,000 hours of activities at different places like public schools, public community schools, uh, hospitals, uh, places of worship, uh, sports clubs, and other public places. We're still in contact with our students, and we're still receiving calls from the teachers telling us that most of the students that actually attended our shows got inspired by our activities, and they actually considering, they seriously considering a career in the science and technology fields. And what kind of activities are you actually carrying out with these young people all around Egypt? So we use our science bus, uh, as I mentioned, to travel across the country to deliver two main activities. The first one is what we call Wonders of Science Show, which is a set of experiments. Uh, it's an interactive show. It's based on inquiry-based shows. So you give the chance for kids to search for the answer themselves. And then they use the demonstration, they interact with them so they can play with a plasma ball, for instance. So they can see liquid nitrogen clouds all over the place. They can see different kind of activities that tackle down different disciplines of science and this is what we call one's science show which is about 45 minutes long and they get the chance to see beautiful movies uh, that can depict ideas about astronomy physics biology and etc 
Uh, not only that, actually, we sometimes we invite students to our main campus so they get a chance to meet scientists so they can get a glimpse of the life of being a scientist, maybe to encourage them to adopt um, science and technology career in the future. And how has the science bus actually impacted the kids you're reaching? You know, what do they say to you after, after they've learned from you? Actually, first to start, you can see the tremendous hunger of the knowledge, which is, was surprising for us. And you can see the excitement of their faces as it's something that they have never seen before. We're still in contact with these students through the teachers uh, who keep telling us that these kids actually considering a career in science and engineering field because of our work here in the fun lab. If you do a bit of statistics, more than 60% uh, of our high school students they prefer to choose humanities and arts track rather than science track. And because of our science shows and our activities that we deliver, uh, this percentage actually decreasing a little bit, that we encouraged a lot of people to adopt science and technology fields. Adam, I'm wondering how do uh, scientists adapt to the current situation of the COVID-19 pandemic, actually? Well, this is uh, actually a question I, I asked Mohammed, and uh, I think this is a great example of a project which has really been trying to adapt and continue to reach otherwise unreachable audiences in spite of the events. Of course, 2020 is hard for scientists and for people working in science engagement, but it's been really inspiring, to be honest, to speak to so many people who are working so hard to find a way around it. Let's meet our next winner. I'm glad to announce Sandra Benitez Herrera. Uh, she is breaking the wall of astronomy and Sahrawi refugees. Uh, what does the jury like about this project, Melanie? Yeah, so we really liked, um, she's, she's bringing science shows and astronomy um, to groups of refugees in the Western Sahara. And what we really liked was how she was using, you know, the wonder of astronomy and the amazingness of the skies above us to both educate, also to help make displaced people, the refugees in Western Sahara, feel part of the global community and maybe at home on planet Earth. So we just thought that it was a really important project that, that she was carrying out here. Let's watch the video and get an impression of how this looks like. Breaking the wall of astronomy and Sahrawi refugees. Sandra Benitez Herrera, Galileo Mobile. The Amalar project tries to inspire and empower the Sahrawi community that is living in the refugee camps in the driest part of the Sahara Desert in Algeria. And we are trying to work closely with the educational community there in order to give them continuous support through different kinds of activities like hands-off activities, sky observations, teacher training, and also donating materials that they actually lack usually. Amanar is also using the cultural aspects of astronomy to bring together communities of different cultures. And for that, we are actually researching together with the Sahrawi uh, Ministry of Culture, uh, the astronomical tradition uh, that they have there that is very rich and is still used in the camps. And this is an international effort that also counts a lot with local uh, organizations. And we are all working together, trying to give voice to the Sahrawi community, the Sahrawi refugees, using astronomy as a, as a tool for diplomacy, for development and to create a better world. Can you give a sense of, of what your audience looks like? Are you focusing this for, for children or is it the entire community? Actually, we target the whole community, but with focus on the educational community. So we are working closely with teachers from primary and secondary uh, schools and also with the students. We want to focus on the teachers because actually they are the multiplying agent. So once we actually leave the camps, they are the ones that have the tools to reproduce all these kind of activities. But when we are there, we also work closely with the students and try to make memorable activities, very motivating and fun activities about science and in particular astronomy. And can you explain how you, you take our astronomical knowledge and you integrate that with the, the knowledge and the traditions 
of these people. So before traveling to the camps, we actually were talking to different experts on the history and the ethnoastronomy of the region. And we discovered the Saharawi people actually look up the sky quite often. They use the stars to guide themselves in the desert, also for religious practices, or even to predict weather conditions. So we wanted also for us to learn about this rich knowledge. So what we did in the activities is to organize discussions and moments in which they could also explain this to us. And we uh, had a, a crew uh, team with us that were also recording all these interviews with the different people that had this knowledge. And now we are producing several videos about their cosmovision. So this also can be shared with a worldwide audience and most importantly will not be lost uh, for the younger generations also to, to know about it. And what would you say the impact of the project has been so far? I think we have mobilized a large group of teachers that are now uh, working together, uh, supporting each other within the camps. And we are also talking to them continuously, uh, offering them now online training, since this year was not possible to travel there. And we are also talking to the authorities there, so this research on their own astronomy can actually be brought to the next level. And we can maybe hire young people to actually work on this, get training and be their own experts on their uh, astronomy. And we're also producing different audiovisuals that we hope also to share with a large audience about all these things that we are doing and that we want to continue in the next years and we hope to do so. If you want to learn more about our breakthroughs, you have a great opportunity to talk to the winners directly in our Q&A session, which follows directly after this session at 3.15 German time. So don't miss the chance. You can have one-on-one -on -one talk or you talk to them in small groups. So I can highly recommend this. I am glad to announce our next winner, and this is Nicolas Bonn, University of Portsmouth. He is aiming to break the wall to astronomy for the vision impaired. Melanie, what uh, did the jury like about this project? Yeah, um, so his project's called the Tactile Universe, which is a wonderful name. And I think we just thought that it was a really inspiring project um, that took science to a group of people who had historically a very significant barrier to overcome to engaging with science. And I think there were two things in particular um, that impressed us. One was how this could be translated to other topics in other countries, so it was very scalable. Um, but also that it was led by somebody who themselves was visually impaired. So it was really coming from that community and being led from them. And we, we really liked that. Thank you, Melanie. So let's dive a bit deeper and watch the video. Breaking the wall to astronomy for the vision impaired. Nicholas Bonn, Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation, University of Portsmouth. So astronomy is traditionally a really visual subject and uh, we're looking at ways that we can bring topics in astronomy research to people with vision impairments through public engagement. Can you describe what impact this has on the audiences you're aiming at? So for a lot of people with vision impairments, it isn't that they don't want to learn about astronomy, it's just that astronomy is a really difficult subject to access because it's so visual. So by creating uh, resources, workshops that we can present to people with vision impairments, uh, it can make them much easier to, to find the information they might want to know if they want to be interested in astronomy or take up astronomy as a job. Can you describe actually what we're talking about here? What are the tools you're using to, to show uh, vision impaired people this world? I've got an example here that I can, I can show you. Um, so we make, uh, I guess you can think of these as analogues of visual images, but they're tactile instead. So where there would be uh, light in an image, like this image on the back here, we have raised parts in the model. So if you run your fingers along this sort of methodically, you can feel all the same things that you would see in an image of something in space. You can see the shape, you can see which bits are brighter, which bits are dimmer. And so using your fingertips, the idea is that you can get exactly the same information that somebody would get if they were looking at sort of one of those beautiful pictures of something in space that we're all used to, to seeing in the news and, and in articles about astronomy. 
Sighted people often describe how awe-inspiring, how beautiful images of space can be. Do you get similar reactions from blind and visually impaired people that you show these, these images to? So we, we definitely do. Um, so I think for a lot of people, um, something like a galaxy, which is what we had a picture of there, is something that they will have been told about, that they will have heard about, but they won't really have much of a sense of the shape of it or somebody won't have compared it to something that they're familiar with. So being able to feel one of these models, they can get a much better sense of what's actually going on. Um, and it's going to be a different way of in interpreting that information. But uh, I, I think, yeah, people are generally really pleased, really happy. Um, they're usually quite excited as well. How has your personal journey in science and research in informed this project? Um, so this is a really personal project for me. Um, so I was born with my vision impairment. I was born three months premature. Um, but even from a really young age, I, I always knew that I wanted to be an astronomer because I, I grew up in Australia. There's lots of dark sky. Um, I've got a tiny, tiny bit of vision and I, I was just able to see maybe some of the brightest stars and it, it just always fascinated me what was what was out there. And so astronomy was a dream of mine. Uh, I chased it for most of my life. I eventually got my PhD in astronomy and the first thing I did was decide not to do research but to, uh, to run a project like this instead because it's something that I would have loved to have access to when I was little to, to learn about astronomy. What lasting impact do you hope that this project will actually have on on blind and visually impaired people. So I think if we're really lucky, we'll, we'll probably see a few more people with vision impairments becoming professional astronomers. Um, I think I would just be happy if more blind people were, were able to be interested in the subject because astronomy is something that links everybody in the world together. Everybody looks up at the night sky, they wonder what's going on. It just holds so much mystery for so many people. Uh, and I think I just want to give people who can't look up into the sky the same way as everyone else the same chance to, to experience that wonder as well. Adam, we have seen uh, two breakthroughs dealing with the issue of uh, astronomy. Why is it such a common topic, actually? I think Nicholas actually just there said it so well. Um, space, the world, uh, the world around our world, the universe, really unites us all, our fascination with what's beyond our planet and uh, our place in the universe. And so I think it's, it's such a natural topic for science engagement and really great to see uh, people reaching out to, to refugee communities, to visually impaired communities, to, to share scientific understanding e even further. Mm -hmm. Now we stay on Earth and we will go to Latin America and this will be our last winner in the category Science Engagement. And I'm glad to announce Oscar Contreras Villarroel. He is aiming to break the wall to a youth-led science world. Melanie, what convinced the jury about this project? Yeah, so this project, it joins young people from about five Latin American countries in the region. Um, and we thought that was really important for building networks in that region. So this just seemed like a really powerful project to invest in the future of scientists in that part of the world. Let's watch the video and get an idea of this project. Breaking the wall to a youth-led science world. Oscar Contreras Villaroel, Fundación Ciencia Joven. Uh, well, Bayer Kimlu is a way to break the wall of science education and youth leadership in Latin America. Each year we select 40 uh, young people from Chile, Argentina, Uruguay and Paraguay and bring them together to train them and teach them about scientific thinking and leadership skills so they can have a positive impact in their communities. Over the last nine years, we've had approximately 400 people that are part of the network uh, and now are changing uh, their communities and Latin America through science and technology. From your perspective, what's currently missing uh, from Latin America when it comes to science education? I think most of the problem is that uh, science education is centered in learning things like concrete data or information about science rather than to focus on how a scientist think and solve problems. Um, so I think we're trying to push the way that uh, kids experience science and can actually solve issues uh, on their day-to-day -day life with evidence and, and science and technology. Could you give an example perhaps of the kind of skill that you are trying to empower these young people with? 
most, I think the, the two main skills are that first, we focus and we foster the leadership uh, so they can actually be an active participant on their society and their communities. Um, so they can push change um, and trying to solve the different issues that are, are affecting them. Uh, but the other part is that they can use evidence uh, and it's sort of like use the scientific method and the science thinking skills to actually solve any problem that they're faced in their day-to-day -day life. It's rather than to sort of an approach to the life and to be critical thinkers uh, that can have a positive impact in their communities. And what do you plan for the kids actually after they leave the course? So they're part of this 10 days science camp that is hosted in Chile. Um, but then there are, um, there are professionals from the foundation that works with them throughout one year, uh, sort of like mentors and helping them through their projects. But after this, they're part of the Kimlu network, which is a self-organized network to all of the youth uh, in Latin America that participated in the program. And they're sort of like organizing into a continuous training program after the, the fellowship. They do these uh, exchanging experiences among each other, co-creating projects um, and actually building a community of leaders that can change Latin America through science and technology. What is your ultimate hope for the impact this project could have on Latin America and I suppose even the rest of the world? This is a long-term investment for sure, but I think that we're trying to demonstrate um, is that youth can actually provide and move change. Sometimes they're left behind, sometimes they think they're not really engaged or committed to the world or to the changes. Sometimes you talk about millennials or, and, and just sort of like disregard them because of their age. Uh, but I think this is a way to build a community and to showcase that actually youth can have an, a positive impact and can bring changes and new ideas to the, to the conversation. So that was our last breakthrough for today. Congratulations to all our winners. You deserve a big, big applause. We can't hear it, but maybe you can feel it. <laughs> so I would like to thank our jury member for this great engagement. Thank you very much indeed. Melanie Sal Smallman, chair of the jury for science engagement. Thank you very much for joining us. And I'm very glad that the technical line kept stable. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Melanie. <laughs> Well, over the past days, we have met 100 stunning breakthroughs in 10 different categories, and each breakthrough was just incredible. Adam, how did you experience uh, making all these interviews? I mean, it's, it's been a bit of a whirlwind experience, which I'm honestly a bit sad to see the end of now. Yeah, um, just looking back at each of the 10 categories, each of the 10 winners in each of them. Uh, yeah, it's been, I've learned so much and yeah. really uh, been so inspired. And the end we're going to see tomorrow because tomorrow we will have our Falling Walls grand final and the jury has to decide who will be the very best 10 breakthroughs of the year 2020. And we will present this to you tomorrow at one o'clock right uh, the same stage here uh, so please join us don't miss this we will have also world leading scientists such as emmanuel charpentier joining us and get their perspective on the future of science in the post corona age so see you tomorrow at the grand final thank you adam for joining me here in the studio thank you for watching and goodbye auf wiedersehen from berlin